uh, we're we're on time, so we it's it's a good time to to get started. Hello, everyone, and, and thanks for coming in and, and listening. Uh, my name is Damian Schenkelman. I'm an, an engineer at Otsido, and, and I, right now I'm working on authorization at scale, and, and we're working on a, a SaaS product to solve that problem. And as part of that, we're we're doing this series of interviews to learn more about authorization in, in the software industry and, and how different companies handle it. And today I'm here with Jake and Aish. They are both engineers at Slack, uh, where again they, they recently did a big revamp of, of how a role management at Slack works. They wrote an article about it, which uh, got a fairly good community uh, like inter interaction engagement. And it, we thought it'd be good to have them here. So guys, welcome. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourselves? Um, sure, uh, I can go first. Uh, my name is Aish. I have been at Slack for about three years now. Uh, and currently I uh, lead uh, the, the project called the, the Rolls Project, which is essentially like building uh, an RPAC system at Slack. Yeah. And before this, I was at uh, companies like PagerDuty uh, and HackerRank, uh, and I've I've dabbled in like different programming languages. And I think like one of my uh, programming related hobbies is like exploring uh, new languages. That's cool. What's what's the latest language you've tried? Well, the latest one is I've been trying to dabble a bit in uh, EFL. I have not heard of, of that one. What, what is it used for? What, what are its origins? Well, like I, I'm, I'm trying to. It's, it's kind of funny. It's, it's just like a language that me and like a, a bunch of my friends started. It was supposed to be like, uh, like a play on like the. Uh, it's, it's just like an inside joke. But essentially, we wrote our own Lisp. Uh, and it's still private, but we're trying to kind of see like can like writing one's own Lisp uh, even work? Yeah, it's, it's it's very interesting. You are not <laughs> the first person that has written their own uh, Lisp. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. Good, good. And, and how about you, Jake? Um, hey, I, I'm Jake. Um, I am based in uh, Bay Area, just like Aish. Uh, I've been at Slack for yeah around four years, and uh, I actually started at Slack as an intern in uh, 2016 in the summer. Um, so it's definitely changed a lot since then. But yeah, I've worked with Aish uh, on the Rolls project. Um, I uh, have not been dabbling in uh, other programming languages particularly, but um, outside of Slack, I actually work in um, emergency services in the medical space. So that's sort of like my side hobby that I uh, like to play around in. Oh, wow. That, that sounds uh, a bit more serious than many of the things we, we might be used to. You'd, you'd be surprised how much overlap there is. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, that's also surprising for me. Yeah, that, that might make a good topic for the future Twitter spaces. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, so again, thanks, thanks guys for joining. I uh, really appreciate your time. I, I know I'm, I'm going to have some fun learning about some of the things that, that you've uh, been building and like designing for. Hopefully everyone in the audience will, will as well. Um, you wrote this blog post recently. Uh, again, fairly big changes from, from what I could infer, but like, I, I leave you to explain. Kind of like, can you share a bit about like the, the context, where you were coming from in terms of like Slack as a product and authorization and, and what you were trying to achieve? Um, sure. I, I can sort of talk more to this uh, and maybe Jake can sort of add uh, towards the end. Um, so historically, Slack has had uh, uh, permission management delegated via something uh, called account types. Um, so anytime you create an account in Slack, uh, you uh, are one of an admin, an owner, a guest, or a regular member. And these are like overlapping hierarchical account types. And the problem here is that uh, these account types are fairly coarse, which means if you're an admin, you would probably be able to view the billing pages in addition to being uh, just able to like rename or archive a channel in some cases. Again, conditions apply. There's like places where you might be able to do something, but these are like pretty coarse. So this kind of like uh, fails to scale at uh, large enterprises. Uh, 
bunch of which are Slack customers. So uh, this was this came up with uh, mostly as a customer requirement that we wanted to build something that addresses uh, granular permission delegation. Um, yeah, um, Jake, do you have like anything to add there? No, I mean that's that's pretty much it. Um, the for example, like I uh, prior to this project, I was an admin um, like internally. And I think most of the time when people, you know, requested me as an admin, it was to like rename or archive a channel. But like, I definitely know I, you know, had too many abilities as an admin. Okay, I, I see that. That makes sense. And w when you talk about uh, cores, are you referring to like maybe admin roles how had too much in scope? And, and then you said, uh, we're going to go separate this admin into smaller admins, maybe a billing admin, a channel mm -hmm. admin. Or, or mm -hmm. were you thinking more about particular things, like uh, someone that can be an admin of, of a subset of channels and, and those mm -hmm. things? How were you kind of like slicing and dicing the problem? Yeah, there's like multiple angles to it. Uh, what, you, what you described is certainly like one of the, the core uh, problems uh, that we're trying to solve. But there's also uh, from like a coding and implementation point of view, the way that it is tied and intertwined with our uh, existing uh, backend is is kind of like uh, it's kind of in this shape where it is like it is an, a pretty big lift for like developers on feature teams to go in and add a new permission check and make it like uh, granular. So there's like there's that part that you sort of said like how do we kind of break down access, but there's also the part like how do we enable like internal like feature teams to kind of like build features without spending a lot of time time trying to like add uh, uh, access control? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So like that, I, one of the things I wanted to kind of like get more into was kind of like what were your goals with with this change? So you you kind of like stated these two. One of them having these more granular goals. The mm -hmm. other one having the so to speak, uh, ability for feature teams to implement new features over time in an easy way. Uh, mm -hmm. did, you, did you have any other goals or were these kind of like the main two things that you were looking to, to meet with this implementation? Uh, those were the main two. There's also one additional goal, which is to have all like permission uh, uh, checks and all sorts of sort of like access control be centralized and be sort of like collected in one single place uh, and not and not have the, the logic sort of like be, be sprinkled all around, all around uh, uh, Slack's different like services and monolith and clients and whatnot. But that's all that I can think of, Jake. Is there like anything that you recall? Um, no, I mean, I think part of also the shift is to start thinking about things in terms of like permissions to take an action as opposed to like the account level roles. So like as opposed to asking the question of like, is this person an admin? Is this person owner? Thinking about it in terms of permissions where it's, can this person take this action? Um, I think that was sort of part of the uh, overall objective. That, that makes sense. Let's let's dive, dive into uh, that. And, and the, another thing I heard was like the, the decoupling of the, of the monolith, right? So let, let's start from, from that part first. Mm -hmm. what, what are the things that, that you are looking for when like saying, oh, we want to decouple all of this logic from the monolith? And, in some cases, it might uh, seem obvious, and, and especially, I guess, for, for you both, that you were probably feeling the pain of, of having that logic intertwined. But maybe for someone that might not be familiar with, with systems like this, what, what were the things that you were looking to achieve by doing, like having that authorization decoupled? Yeah, I, I think this goes hand in hand with one of the goals that we just stated, which is to kind of have all this permission uh, logic sort of be aggregated and be collected in one single place. Uh, there's definitely argument that this could have been a library inside the monolith, but that does not really speak to the, the scalability sort of like part of it. Like if we want to like scale the permission system uh, in a decoupled way from the monolith, uh, that won't be, that won't, that would not have been possible with uh, a library. Uh, the second thing uh, which was a challenge is uh, regarding like enforcing boundaries within the monolith. Uh, the monolith is fairly like shared across teams and how do we 
how does one sort of like enforce boundaries in terms of like the interfaces, the overall architecture, and still remain inside the monolith? These are again like two big concerns. And making a service outside of it meant that we could scale it independently. We could have other services called directly into it and also kind of enforce that boundary because at the end of the day, it's a different repository uh, and has a different like change management process. Uh, that's what, that, at least that's what I can think of. Jake, is, is there any, anything else that you can think of regarding our choice for service? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think like realistically, like you said, um, there be, there would be benefits to both. Um, I would also talk about like the development experience, I guess, like, um, the Slack monolith is obviously quite large um, and we share things like a deployment pipeline, for example. So making um, changes to, uh, to, for example, in, in our uh, decoupled service, we have our own uh, dedicated deployment pipeline, which I think has a lot of benefits to it. Um, similarly, getting uh, like containerized uh, like uh, abilities to have, you know, to be able to scale up pods as uh, traffic increases, et cetera. Um, I think there's benefits to that. There's probably, there would probably have been benefits to um, keep it in the monolith as well, but um, I I don't think it's sort of a clear cut decision one way or the other. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and again, what, I I usually have conversations with people both again at Otsido and, and at other places. And one of the things they they ask is, oh, we, we like we, they say, oh, we want to decouple things, we want to have services. And it's not that it's good, it's not that it's bad, but like there needs to be a reason why you're doing that. And and at least so that you can see whether you achieve what you are trying to do, right? So in this case, hey. We want to have this separate deployment pipeline. We want uh, one service not to crash with, with when the other one does. We want memory to be separated. All of those things can't be done in process. Even if you have like a very good monorepo deployment interface, it's still a single process for a computer. Right. Uh, the, the other thing you mentioned, Shake, was like being able to check permissions and, and not roles. Uh, can we expand a bit on that? On, on the one hand, how do you think about these two things differently and, and how should like people listening in think about these things? And, and the other, the, like the second part to that question is what are the benefits of doing that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so I, like I mentioned, like historically the, the generic admin roles like we've had um, in Slack before is, you know, you're trying to take an action and the way we determine whether you're permitted to take that action is by saying, are you an admin, for example? Um, but in the case of, for example, archiving a channel, which is a pretty simple permission, which, uh, as we mentioned in the blog post, is defined with the channel's admin role. We're not checking at the um, at, at the actual permissions level. Uh, is this person a channel's admin? Rather, are we checking, do they have the permission to take this action? Which is, I think, uh, all we care about, I think, as developers from, like, a, you know, for example, like a security perspective, we're not really we don't really care what their role is at the end of the day. It's more, are they taking this action for the right reason, um, if, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think it does. And, and it probably means that like as, as a client, as an internal client team, all I need to know is what action the user is trying to take rather than what role do they have and does that role in our current version of our authorization model have that permission? So you're kind of like making it simpler for clients and at the same time, I guess, opening up some opportunity for future changes in the backend without... Right, changing. exactly. So, so for example, if you had um, two roles that happen to have the overlapping permissions, you would, if you were check, uh, if you were, for example, checking... Um, the actual role level, uh, you would have to check every role that had that permission. But instead, this way, you just check the permission. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's great. Um, and one thing I noticed, like, kind of like maybe closing in on this, like the background and the, the motivations is um, I did not see a mention f uh, about groups. Was there any customer feedback about that? What made you decide, if you can share that, why uh, groups is not uh, a supported feature? Um, I think we just decoupled it from uh, the original implementation and we, we launched support for groups like pretty recently. Uh, cool. That's great. Excellent. Yeah. So like going kind of like following up on that, uh, I know again Slack has a couple of different offerings, right? So it's not just, okay, we, we are Slack. We, we are uh, a B2B company selling to, to other businesses. You have different uh, features. You have enterprise grade, but you have organizations. Could you share a bit about the differences from an authorization perspective with these different plans? 
Um, sure, yeah. Uh, when it comes to like different plans, the in terms of engineering, uh, the backend is shared. So uh, the way uh, the way the backend currently the actual permission evaluation backend works is it doesn't really it doesn't really matter what part you're what plan you're on as long as as long as you have any sort of like eligible permission grants the backend uh, the evaluation backend is gonna kind of do its job the assignment sort of part is aware of what pricing plans uh, is it like uh, like available to your pricing plan or not uh, and all that stuff so these are like decouple so the the read path and the evaluation part is really a simple interface and like Jake described that is like so can a user take an action or not but on the right path on the on the allocation part we actually ensure that certain certain pricing plans can do certain things or not yeah oh I see that that makes a lot of sense so which means that basically and there's a bit more I'm going to use quotes, and no one can mm-hmm. see them though. Complexity yeah. on yeah. the on the right path to make sure: hey, is is this? Uh, what are the roles that we should display when we are trying to assign something? And at the same time, I guess on the back end, making sure yeah. that whatever role is assigned, it's it's part of the plan. But then the reads mm-hmm. are always the same. Okay, that's good. Yep. Excellent. Um, how did you start? Like again, you, you mentioned your goals. You, you want to decouple things. You want to have this like permission level checking, you want to give teams the opportunity to kind of make some of these decisions themselves. How did you start uh, designing the new system? Like, again, I guess Slack mm-hmm. is, again, big, big company, complex mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. How did this whole thing kind of like come to mind and, and come to fruition? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think uh, we, uh, we started, uh, uh, by first, like like most things uh, that we do at Slack, we just started with uh, the customers and uh, like uh, kind of like based on a lot of like customer demand and like w- what sort of our customers wanted. Uh, internally, uh, from an engineering point of view, just besides like our like uh, Slack customers, uh, for our team, the in- internal teams that were sort of trying to build or building new features. Uh, that required any authorization checks were also sort of customers to our team, which mean which meant that uh, we worked in with uh, those teams. We went, we create, we did a series of like interviews with uh, several tech leads. Uh, we interviewed, I guess, about like probably like about like fifteen to twenty folks inside the company across different groups. As as inside Slack, we call them pillars, uh, and kind of gathered feedback about what they think regarding how at least like how a new system is going to help their team um that is the engineering part and uh we also kind of like looked at like the customer demand and besides like this, because this is a classic rpac system we also like went in and like did like research in terms of like like what was out there uh, and how, like as in in terms of existing like research work and like went over the best practices uh and then finally kind of came up with uh, something that kind of uh, work for us. Okay, that's, that's cool. Uh, a, a couple of uh, questions about that, maybe not necessarily authorization related, but uh, I, I've worked a lot with platform teams, and, and one thing I, I'm always interested about learning is how they view and how they work with with their internal customers. For mm-hmm. example, in your case, is there a, is there an internal product manager that helps you do all of this interviewing, this research? Is that done only by engineers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, for this particular project, uh, our external product manager or like our like regular product manager it was the, the person who sort of like helped us kind of like uh, set up a bunch of those. Uh, but uh, I and like a bunch of like other engineers, we kind of like did the actual editing part. There was already like some metrics and some sort of questions and some other things that our PM had prepared us for. Okay. And, and, and what, what about the, like the industry research part? What, where did that lead you? Yeah, uh, I think uh, we uh, did a bit of research and I think uh, it, was, it was really interesting to see how RBAC is sort of like built uh, uh, in different systems, uh, not just like in SaaS, but also like in different parts. And the, the, the reason was that compared to the, the actual RBAC like standard, if you kind of read it, it's pretty dry. Like every sort of like product seems to be doing its own like twist on that. Like there is like a, 
a very nuanced difference between like what the standard says and how like companies implement our back. Uh, that was definitely like a pretty interesting uh, observation that we saw. So, and again, like rather than just like going in and trying to implement the standard right off, right off, uh, whatever, like exactly word by word, uh, we ended up building the RBAC system that works best with uh, with Slack. Yeah, makes makes sense. And um, what does the the pro the process? Of getting such like a, again a big change, uh, security related change as, as as well, kind of like approved and, and get enough um, buying, so to speak, from internal stakeholders to get it done. What did that look like? Yeah, so uh, most big engineering projects, actually big and small, most projects at Slack go through uh, an architecture review. Um, so there's uh, an architecture review council that actually like uh, goes through these. Uh, proposals. Uh, this is from the engineering side. There's also like a process on the product side to kind of vet projects that kind of go. But from an engineering side, we uh, we had uh, an architecture review uh, to kind of like share our design. So the the request and this is like classic request for comments. Like so, the way this works is uh, uh, tech leads for a project come up with a request for comments, put it out there, share it like across like different teams uh, and different engineering groups kind of get feedback and then go into the a common forum called architecture review where you can kind of like resolve a lot of those like questions and concerns. So we kind of went through that process. Uh, our product sec team, the product security team was involved from the very beginning. We also have a pretty uh, uh, great like a security review process where uh, uh, security engineers are actually embedded in our team. So as we are developing the security engineers, where two security engineers were actually embedded in our team to kind of help us make the, those, those like best decisions and kind of like uh, ask questions regarding implementation details. Yeah. Okay, that sounds great. And, and I guess again, having like that shift left mentality, having security there early on was, was probably very valuable while, while you were doing this to avoid round trips, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was immensely valuable. Cool. Um, so like, again, for, for anyone that hasn't read the blog post, uh, I strongly recommend again opening it uh, it's like in Slack engineering, uh, role management at Slack, so you can Google it while, while we're chatting. Can you guys walk us through the uh, architecture, kind of like high level? What, what happens when I kind of like have my app running on my machine or maybe on, on my phone, all the way to kind of like the back end and, and how things work when, whenever I perform an action? Um, sure. Uh, Jake, do you want to talk about the authoritative and the non-authoritative checks, and then maybe I can sort of add to it at the end? Yeah, sure, that sounds good. Um, so uh, if you are a user of Slack, you um, will log in, maybe you will uh, hop into a channel. So uh, the way we're sort of decoupling this, like I said, is uh, between what we're calling authoritative versus non-authoritative checks. So at the end of the day, we're prioritizing the security level and like the ability to actually take an action so for example, if you wanted to archive a channel, that is a definitive API call, you are making an action. The non-authoritative aspect of that would be showing, for example, in the UI. Uh, if we are allowing you to archive a channel, we need to make 100% sure that that is uh, real time when you're, you have a permission revoked, for example. Let's say your, your role is revoked and you're no longer able to archive channels. So when you make that API request, um, we send that from the client up to uh, our actual web app um, boxes, and we'll make that check by hitting our permission service and saying, does this person have the ability to take that action, come back with either uh, an allow or deny. Uh, and if they do, we allow them to archive the channel. And if they uh, don't, we don't allow them to archive the channel. The difference between those being we the API level checks are authoritative. So those absolutely have to be in real time versus the UI itself, which is connected via WebSocket um, to our edge caches are not necessarily completely in real time. So if, for example, there's a delay between when your permission is revoked and when you don't see the, uh, the option in your UI, that's okay. But the ability to take an action is what we've sort of prioritized is the be all you need to be authoritative. I, I see that that makes sense. So let me kind of like play that back uh, for you. So there are kind of like two places where actions or the the permission to perform an action is, is checked. 
There's one in the UI. It's, it's mostly a user experience check where latency is critical. So you want to make sure that like, permission information is propagated all the way from your servers to clients as fast as possible. But all that's happening is in deciding whether a particular button or something like that should be enabled or disabled or displayed. Right. That's yeah. That's correct. Okay. And then on the back end, when like that button might have a, an API call that it performs, it's it sends some data about the login user over to that API call on the server, and then you say, hey does this user actually really, really, really have permission? And that's when you can like allow them to perform that action. Otherwise, you probably return like a, an error code. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, ha so I, I have a couple of like questions here. Like the, the first one is, what's the, the impact uh, from a business perspective or, or from a customer satisfaction perspective uh, that latency has? Like what happens when, when you see that like maybe propagation of these uh, changes is slow? So, um, because the non-authoritative checks are an eventually consistent system, uh, there is, like you said, there, there could be a possibility of users seeing uh, a potential delay. Uh, the good thing here is that this is all, like, uh, this is all built on top of uh, Slack's existing uh, edge cache uh, called Flano. And, like, publicly, we have talked about Flano for several years now. Um, uh, Flannel has a, a team sharded sort of architecture. So and delay in one of the delay for one of like Slack workspaces does not necessarily translate to delay for others. So it is sort of isolated. Uh, the second thing to an extent, to an extent it is isolated. Uh, and uh, as, as far as delays is concerned, uh, we have like pretty strictly defined SLAs there. Now, the end user experience, what could what what would happen is one might end up either seeing, uh, and this is very rare, but one might end up seeing a view that they probably uh, like might have just lost access to, or, or like they might see like an a button somewhere that kind of says you can take an action, but when they click on that button, when the request goes to the back end, they'll say kind of things fail, and uh, if they sort of like close and like restart the app or just like kind of like Relog. They don't even need to like relog, and as long as they kind of come back to the app, uh, the 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 data gets like refetched. So that should be kind of taken care of. So again, it's fairly rare, and it it should be sort of like uh, isolated to a given uh, workspace, uh, and we have SLAs defined. But in the unlikely event that happens. Um, that should catch up, and uh, if not, like we do, like a hard fetch every time you sort of like reopen the app. Okay, I, I see. So that that's interesting because, uh, and we'll get into kind of like some of the eventually consistent aspects if we can a bit. But like th there's this trade-off here where like you might see some stale data sometimes, like very rarely if things mm -hmm. are not working very good. But in general, this is actually very good for customer experience because you're pushing data very close to them to this edge so that whenever they fetch something, whenever they're doing yep. anything, they, they have that data kind of like mm -hmm. close by. Um, is this, is this trade-off between like consistency for, for these checks and, and user experience intuitive uh, for everyone? Is this something that you, you all had to discuss? How, how do you come to these decisions? So uh, this was sort of like... Uh, this was a very nice side effect of one of our original goals. So to kind of uh, refer back to myself from like uh, some time ago, like one of our goals was to like not have duplicate code sort of sprinkled around, not have duplicate permission code sprinkled around in uh, the iOS, Android, the desktop, the web app. And uh, the way that we did this was like we made those clients, as we call them Slack clients, uh, directly call the edge cache. And uh, the benefit that we got here was that uh, was that there was the clients themselves the cl don't really have any business logic regarding what you should and what you should not see. There's no like JavaScript or like Kotlin or like uh, any sort of like Swift code that says yep. it can you do this. So this was like like a nice outcome. Uh, the reason that we did this is again we sort of like built on top of existing patterns. So. Um, our edge cache 
like if you sort of like open Slack, you kind of see the list of channels that you're part of. You sort of see like the number of people in like your channel. A lot of that info is cached on the client, but that client actually gets that info from the edge cache. Uh, we hadn't really done permission caching before, so but this was like a very natural like way to kind of build on top of our edge cache infra and just like piggyback on what is already there and just like put our permissions because it's closer to the user. It sort of like avoids like kind of like sprinkling that complexity to the clients. And at the same time, it gives us that ability to uh, just like uh, use the existing infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's very cool, it makes sense. So let, let's move now to like from the, the client closer now to the, to the edge cache. Um, a couple of, of, of things that I, I think might be interesting to chat about there are, are, first of all, when and how does the edge cache get updated? How does that work? Yeah, um, so every so because it's a cache, and in the beginning, there's uh, it is not completely lazy. So we kind of preemptively uh, get data for a given team, and it's sort of like split around. So for it, for every single workspace, the cache is kind of like preemptively sort of like based on some TTL value. It's played around. It's kind of like uh, filled in at least the permission aspects to it. Uh, now, when it comes to like updating the cache, we we have an internal real time event stream um, also exposed to the public via the the events API. And uh, anytime you take an action in Slack, an event is actually like emitted. Um, so at a high level, at a very high level, the this is the same event that goes into the edge cache and invalidates or updates the cache and resets it with the new value. Okay, I see that that makes sense. So uh, you you were able to build on top of like an already existing Slack feature, the, the events API. That's that's very interesting and. What's the ratio of this, like, reads versus writes? How often are, are permissions changed versus how often are permissions read? Like, in, in terms of, like, maybe orders of magnitude. Um, I'd say, I don't remember the metrics off the top of my head, but uh, we have a very, very read-heavy workload. Um, so even if we don't take in the non-authoritative checks and only look at the authoritative ones, uh, the ratio would probably be somewhere more than 50 is to one, probably more, probably more than that, but just to be a bit conservative, I would say more than 50 is to one. Okay, so it's again, very, very big difference uh, between reads and writes, which again, ma makes sense for, for the system like this. So we, we now know again how the, the cache is updated. We know what the client asks for. Now, let, now let's go through like the, the, the other side of this, which is when we actually perform an action. So let's say I want to archive a channel. What data does the client send to the Slack web server saying, hey, let's archive this? Uh, how does it say, this is a user, for example, that started the action because we have to like still do that authoritative check on the backend, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the client, the client simply asks, uh, like the edge cache. Again, it's it's very similar to what uh, the backend would ask the service, uh, but the client would ask the edge cache, "Can this user take an action on this thing?" So it's actually like you you have a few entities in play. You have your like channel, for example. You have your your user and you have the permission. Uh, you have this triplet that gets sort of like the user the the client uses to query, and uh, the edge cache response. And this is this is kind of similar. And ideally, it should be the exactly same values that uh, the the backend is going to send over to the service for performing the authoritative checks. Does it sound correct to you, Jake? Like, if you want to like add there or like. Yeah, I'm, so like uh, generally, it's it's yeah exactly that where we have a user, we have a permission being requested, and we have the context from which that is being requested. So, for example, if you're assigned um, 
a uh, role as, for example, like a channels admin, if you want to archive a channel at like a workspace level, and you're trying to archive a channel at the enterprise organization level, we, that is not just sufficient to be assigned a um, channels admin role at the workspace level, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Uh, maybe like, to, be, to be clearer, what I was uh, thinking about was like, when I actually want to go archive the channel, so not from the perspective of the edge cache, but from the perspective of the like, Slack web app server, I guess there's an endpoint there. I'm going to make something up. It's post slash API slash something archive channel. And, and I have to essentially, like, from the client, send some credentials or, or an assertion or something that says, hey, this is a current login user. I should be able to do this. How, how is that information transmitted over to the server? Um, gotcha. So from the, from the client to the, the, the backend server or like from the client to the, the edge cache? To, from the client to the backend server. Gotcha. So the, the client would just continue doing its business. So it would, so just like you said, it would just call that whatever post, whatever channel dot create or something like that. Uh, I'm trying not to use like real APIs, uh, but uh, the, the client would just call the backend and the backend would actually, so when, when client calls, most of the things would land in Slack's like core backend, the monolith. The monolith is going to now have that context regarding what is like JJ said, like what, what like team or like channel, what user, what is like the actual context and what permission that, that, that context is going to be there at that, like that API endpoints backend. And it is going to like make another call to the service to say, okay, here's the context. This is a user trying to act, act in this context. Does this seem reasonable to you? Okay. So then at some point, the, the Slack backend needs to call kind of like the permission service, which, which we talked about earlier and say, hey, can this user archive this channel? Is, is that mm -hmm. kind of like the, the syntax? Um, yes. how does it, where does it get the, the user ID from? Because the channel and, mm -hmm. the, and the action to delete are actually yep. kind of like coming from the request. Where does the user data come from? So everything you do in Slack, everything that anyone does in Slack is tied to your like identity inside Slack. It is not explicit, but implicitly it is tied to your Slack identity. Like if I send you a message, it'll say that I sent Damien a message. Uh, the way this works under the hood is we have, we have uh, this is going to get translated to an API call, which is going to have like some sort of a cookie or some sort of token. And uh, that is directly tied to your user identity, your like user ID. Okay, so th there is a way again from the request here through a cookie that maps to a database that where you can get the, the user identifier from or from yeah. a token that might be a signed assertion to say, hey, this is a user ID that's actually like someone you can trust. Go check if they have this permission. Yep. Excellent. And then, so again, you, you call the permission service, it replies, and then you, you basically continue executing that, that logic. Um, what did the, wh where did you add the logic to, like, to authorization? Because you went from this like, role-based model to the permission model. Is this a middleware? Is this uh, an agent that you're running like, as a proxy on the Slack monolith? Like, where does authorization run? Um, so there's, there's like, this is again, like pretty interesting, just given like our architecture, uh, where do you mean like where along the request path, where, where, which part of the stack? Uh, I, I think everything it's which part of the stack, well, we're mm -hmm. in the request path and even mm -hmm. like, if you can share a bit about like the concrete, like how, what does the code look like, right? Yeah, so uh, the actual authorization regarding like uh, like can a user really do this thing? Uh, so uh, like or like is this like person really locked in? That happens right as soon as you send that like auth token or cookie. So that happens like inside our like monolith. Uh, there's like existing authorization code. Uh, that does this, like that's like the traditional way of doing this, um, like like the historical way. Uh, under like this new like provision system, the way the way this this sort of like works is, 
it goes inside the monolith and uh, in the past this was kind of sprinkled all, all around it, it goes to your like api handler and that sort of like starts processing it it gets your data right and then that calls into like our like libraries uh but at the end of the day, like what we have created is like an abstraction. So there is like uh, an abstraction inside uh, our like monolith where uh, we have like a set of like reusable rules. And to the end developer, they don't really need to care about like, is this going to a service? Is what, how is it, this is going to come, come from? But the way that an end developer would use, like they would just use one of these existing rules. So that says, can user archive channel? And the application code, be it like in the API handler or in the library, is just going to be using one of these like rules, these rules classes that we have created. And these rules, that rule validation permission layer is where like the actual like calls happen. And that entire abstraction is kind of like reusable throughout the monolith. Okay, that, that makes sense. So then if I understand correctly, like, let me kind of like, rephrase this back to you your team went into the monolith code you you sent a couple of, of uh, change requests saying hey we need to add these things that will be reusable by any other team mm -hmm. so that you can actually uh, go like reuse this then all, all each team needs to do is they need to change their existing handlers to mm -hmm. use this again it's either going to be an abstract class or, or an existing library say hey go do this check here and then continue processing right Yep. Uh, at a high level, yeah, that that is exactly how we did it. Like we also uh, uh, want, and we also have been getting teams to kind of write their own rules. So if a team has a pretty like niche use case or like a very different one from existing rules, they can just go in and write their own rules, uh, and some other team can maybe use it someday. Okay, so, so that, I, I want to get into that, and I'm, I'm actually getting a, a question via one of my, like, the community slacks that I'm on that I wanted to ask later, but you just touched on that. What does the experience uh, to add new rules for the, for teams look like, which was one of the goals that, that we talked about kind of like at the beginning? What do I mm -hmm. need to do as a, as a developer in one of Slack feature teams to add new authorization rules? Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, point. So... Um, Let's say you're creating a new feature to, I don't know, like take an action, take an action X. Uh, you would need to go in and define that permission, or that says take action X and X action X. Um, permissions inside Slack are fixed set of values, so we have like a, like a, a gRPC, like protobuf that sort of like defines whatever whatever is like the allowed set of values. So you need to like teams will need to update those. Uh, and there's like tooling, I think, that, that we sort of talked about in the blog. Uh, so ultimately, what the, the, the process of adding like uh, a new uh, permission is essentially like running the CLI tool. Uh, and Jake can talk more about the CLI tool itself. But like essentially like running that CLI tool and once you sort of have the core abstractions, like we also do a lot of like code generation. So the CLI tool, tool does a lot of like code generation. Um, you should be in a good position to like use that new permission. As far as adding the rule goes, we again, we have like very foundational, like uh, uh, inspired through a lot of like functional programming paradigms. Like we, we already have like a lot of like mappers and reducers uh, that sort of like take in any sort of permissions. So your code might be like as much as like three lines. So you just like, like add your sort of like permission to an existing like configuration and it should just like work pretty much. Or like if you're really def defining a new role, you would just like extend or, or like include one of those existing rules and you would just like plug in your permission value there. Uh, the, the North Star that we are aiming for is to, is trying to make this, the process of adding a new permission and a permission rule as declarative as possible. Okay, that, that makes sense. So uh, let's can we dig into that a bit, uh, Jake? For example, let's say let's say we want to make up. I, I'm going to kind of like create a new feature. I don't know. Uh, let's say we can delete three users at a time now in Slack. That's a feature that customers have been asking about. What would a team need to go do to create that permission and maybe assign it to to some of the roles that we have? What does the path look like? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so uh, the way sort of the inspiration for us with this was actually for like us internally, where we wanted to add new. So we we defined these three roles that we wanted to add initially based on the customer request. Um, we did one at a time. And I think we found that it was a bit cumbersome to exhaustively find all the places in which we needed to either add a new role or a new permission because we you know, decouple those in our code base and we needed to make sure it was being appropriately passed to the permission service. Um, so what we ended up doing was writing uh, a CLI script. Uh, and the idea was to, once you've defined uh, what your role is going to be, you've decided that this RBAC system is indeed what you're supposed to be doing, because not every you know uh, case necessarily uh, should be using the system. But once we've decided it is, all you do is to uh, you run this. You say, "This is the name of my role," or "This is the name of my permission." This is the description. This is who um, the users uh, who it's allowed to be assigned to, or this is the pricing plan it's um, allowed to be on. After you run that tool, everything should kind of be generated on your local branch. Um, after which you make it, like you said, a change request. Um, and by default, all of those requests will uh, post a message in our channel, uh, the team who built this feature, so that we're aware of all um, upcoming role changes, just so uh, so that there aren't um, any breaking changes that go out with our, uh, without us seeing them. Um, but yeah, generally, it should be hopefully uh, pretty smooth at this point. OK. And, and, and what does the, the rollout an approval of this looks like? Because I guess there are like two parts of the discussion, right? There's the software part, which is, okay, what components need to be redeployed, if, if any, what things are stored in, in the database that basically you, you make changes to that as part of like maybe CLI execution and then you can read in runtime. That's kind of like one part. But but before that, what happens before? Like who needs to approve these things? Is like, Does the security team get involved? when I run the CLI and when, when I send a change request, what, what's the story like there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and the I think the implication is when you're building out a new role, it's kind of already gone through that process where you've talked with security, you've talked with the appropriate product managers, you are sure that this role is the right um, actual product uh, to be building out. Um, so when, when you actually run this tool, the implication is that you should be running it. Uh, so when you actually create that branch. You, part of the uh, configuration is you will roll it uh, behind a feature flag, for example, so where you say, okay, we you know, need to put this for QA first, we need to enable this for dev first, or 1% of users, or uh, et cetera. So it allows you to have a little more control over it so that if you add a new role and it's not just suddenly appearing for all new customers uh, and taking them by surprise, you have a little more granular controls over that. Okay, that's that's great. And, and in terms of like deploying the rules, like from more from from a software perspective, what does deploying a rule mean? Is that I add uh, a code file in a repository and then just like CI/CD? Is this I add a row to a database and that kind of like starts running? Um, right. Yes. So so when when you actually run that tool, it should uh, make the configurations in both the protocol buffer and also in any necessary JSON, which is where we're uh, defining these new roles. So uh, once the, the actual JSON, which is the authoritative way we're considering these roles, um, is deployed, that's deployed through the monolithic path, so this, the shared deployment pipeline. But additionally, if the permission service is supposed to be aware of it, that is in its own service, so it has its own deployment pipeline that needs to be uh, deployed as well. So there, there'd be two deployment paths there. Okay, so you, you basically like update the client and, and server's protobufs. Uh, again, there's probably a versioning mechanism somewhere along right. the way, and then the, the JSON has the, the role definition. Uh, yes. Can, can teams create uh, rules, not just roles? Yes, so so the, the actual rule definitions where you say, um, so, so we have the, you know, the idea of these policies. I, th I think we, we called one out in uh, the blog post, which was the uh, allowing if the user has the, you know, allow if users uh, has channel uh, archive permission, for example. So anyone can define that. That's defined in the application layer and the monolith. Um, that's uh, not even necessarily limited to just the role system we built out. So several other teams, any other team can build um, a new uh, rule, but the actual consumption of that rule uh, you know, for example, allow if they have the uh, channel archive permission, they need to, you know, the channel archive permission needs to exist prior to actually calling on. Okay, okay, that, that makes sense. So let's let's kind of like backtrack a bit because I, I actually skipped ahead. Um, 
what happens then when, when we call from the, the Slack backend, we, we call the permission service, right? We, we say, hey, tell me if, if this user can perform, ha, has this permission, can perform this action on, on this uh, entity, right? Um, a set of rules run, that's, that's what the post explains. How do you figure out which rules should run for mm -hmm. each of these checks? Yeah, so uh, this is something that, like, these checks also contain sincerely, like, business logic. Uh, not all of them, some of them. So this is, again, left up to the team that is developing the feature. So, for example, if you have a, t a feature that can only be used by admins on the 14th day of a lunar month of a given year, just making this up, uh, this is a pretty complex business rule. And the way you would do this is you would go in and define it in uh, your own rule and do this. Uh, now, how does this translate to the permission system? Well, like it could mean that you have a permission which is tied to a role and that role only works when these sort of conditions are applied. Uh, in the role-based system, these actual the actual business logic is defined on the permission service. And the rule to call that is actually in the monolith. But in addition to that, if you have additional rules, like, like the, the most complex one that I described, you would define it in uh, the monolith. So to kind of like simplify what I just said, there are the, ro the role-based uh, grants, which is just tied to a, a role. Like if a role has a permission allow, which is simple call from the monolith, but if there's anything else which is complex, which requires like writing custom, crafting custom rules, they are defined in the monolith. Okay, okay, I see, that, that makes sense. And what does that look like in terms of like, from a programming perspective? Is this like a, an interface, which is like, I don't know, mm -hmm. rule yeah. interface, and is there like yeah. a chain of responsibility, the, the, the one that results first finishes, otherwise it continues executing? Precisely, it is precisely as you described, yeah. Okay, and like who builds this, like the, the chains? How, how do you know which chain or what, what chain to create for, for each type of check? Where, where is that defined? So that that is, I, I think like that is left to, to the implementing team. Like if, if like the implementing team feels like uh, they need to check for like one particular thing before the other, it is left to them. So they can sort of like, mix and match these rules. They can define the order of execution. The first one runs first, and then it kind of falls over to the second one if the, if, if the first one does not return an okay, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so then, so what, 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 what I'm understanding is the, the backend calls the permission service. It might get back some data, some rules might, might run there. But then based on what you get back, you also have the response go through like this chain of responsibility and provide the final response. So the if, if like going more towards like an authorization parlance, the enforcement of the policy is happening on the backend, but also yes. the decision is also happening on the backend. And the permission service is more like of a policy information point. Is that yes. accurate? Yes, that is that is that is correct. That is accurate as of now. Uh, for legacy features, that is how it works. For for things that had that are purely role based, let's say there's like things which which work only with roles, uh, that is just going to be a pass through. So in that in that pass through world, you'll only have one rule that is called the permission service, and you get the response back. Okay, okay, that that makes sense. Thanks, thanks for for clarifying. No um, in, in the diagram from the blog post, one of the things we see is that we're, we're, you're, you are using a, uh, MySQL with Bitess. Can, can you share a bit about like, the, the storage story for this? Uh, I know for, on the one hand that like, the, again, the permission service is writing to the database, the, but permission checks are going to the service, but like, it's kind of like a, this uh, round trip because also the backend is reading from the same database. Uh, could you share a bit about kind of like maybe the evolution and decision making behind that decision? Yeah, we're we're constantly uh, like uh, like kind of uh, trying to uh, look for better ways, and this is again like a very very evolving architecture. Uh, 
but as seen in this uh, diagram, the the database here is actually the shared resource between the both uh, the the monolith, uh, the web app monolith, and the permission service. The way uh, uh, this works is the web app monolith writes new role assignments to the uh, DB, and the permission service actually reads from the DB. So this this DB sort of becomes the uh, the point of integration here. Uh, this is again like something that we uh, are trying to kind of like uh, make it better, and this is something that was done uh, to kind of make things keep things sim like simple and moving. Uh, the 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 way that this really works nicely is because our write load is actually very light compared to our uh, read load, so there's like very few writes compared to our reads. Uh, so the web app monolith just like writes to the DB and the, the service just like reads from the, D the DB. There's like probably like one or two places where we, we where we do need like read your own writes kind of behavior in the web app, uh, which is the Slack monolith. And uh, there, I think uh, these are only the administrative pages. These are not the permission evaluation paths. These are just like permission grant pages where like if you're a, uh, uh, like a Slack administrator, if you're trying to grant a permission, we need to kind of show to the end user that this permission grant went successful. So those are like very few cases where the web app monolith actually reads from the DB. Most of the cases are actually just like writes. Uh, and uh, to answer your question, the way the the way that we made this decision was because we uh, at Slack we we use the tests pretty much all throughout and. Uh, this was like the and like our like user sort of like sharded permission schema definitely like fit very well with the Vitess world. Uh, as far as like why one DB, it is again like uh, the first step in the evolution, and we are like constantly revisiting and constantly changing things around. Okay, so it's kind of like playing this back. There was this very nicely managed sharded DB cluster that you could take advantage of. You mm -hmm. saw that because of the right load, you would not be affecting it a lot. You said, why would we create another database for this? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, one of the things you mentioned was um, read your own rights. And, and I, I think where I know where this is going, uh, but again, I think it, it will be interesting to, to ask, mm -hmm. what makes it so that the, the web app needs to read directly from the database? rather than go through the service in order to uh, read its own rights? And, and even before that, what, what does reading your own rights mean? Because that, that might be kind of a term not, not everyone necessarily is familiar with. Yeah, so in our case, it is actually really simple. Uh, let's say if you are a Slack administrator on Enterprise Grid, uh, if you log in today, you'll see uh, a page that says roles. You'll see channels admin, roles admin, and a few other things. Um, and if you go to channels admin, you might be able to just go and say, let's assign Aish and Jack, Jake, channels admin for whatever, like our, our test team. Um, once that request goes through, like it just like, it's going to like write some rows in the DB, do some caching, send some messages, like fire off some like events, a bunch of things happen. But at the end of the day, we need to kind of render something on the page that says, here's the, the new list of users with that role. So what we just did is we wrote some roles in the DB and we read them back the same request. We actually read them back. That API call says, okay, the, here's like the new roles for Aish and Jake. Um, so here, what the request did was the request went in, wrote some data and read it back. Uh, and in order to do this, uh, like Damien, like you said, like we, we certainly could have gone to the service and we certainly could have like asked the service to read from the DB. Um, and that is something that we uh, definitely spent some time thinking about, but we really, we really wanted to keep the services like surface area minimal. We did not want the service to do any CRUD operations. Like we did not really want the service to say, give me a list of users. We kind of really wanted the service to just do permissions. So, in order to kind of maintain a smaller surface area, we decided to just like get the data from the DB. And again, we might we might look at like some of our load patterns, 
uh, some of our, our like use cases for the API and how the API evolves before actually settling for the final architecture. All I can say right now is I think like reading from the DB is something that we do right now, but depending on uh, the load and like the, uh, the reading the own, like the update volume, we might like change it in the future. Okay, uh, sorry, I was having trouble unmuting uh, my, my finger and it's, it's overly big for the pattern. Anyways, so w um, does that mean that, for example, all use cases that are more like give me all users that have the possibility of doing this action or give me all of the things that this user can do, they are all going from the backend over to the database directly? Mm -hmm. Um, not really, no, not for the permission evaluation path. Like if you, if the backend asks the permissions, if the backend wants to figure out, can I take one of these like 20 actions, it directly goes to the permission service. But if there is an administrative page uh, that sort of says, here's the list of users with this role, those, those go to the DB directly rather than going to the service. Okay, thank, thanks for clarifying. That, that makes no sense. Um, yeah. What does the scaling of of this look like, both on the like again the the permission service side, the, I guess more or less stateless, uh, but but mm -hmm. I know there's kind of there's a cache there as well mm -hmm. uh, from the diagram, mm -hmm. and and also on the database side again we we talked about sharding, but let's get more into like your specific business challenges and, and how sharding benefits you in your particular case. Yeah, uh, so uh, I can start with the DB first. The the Vitesse database is uh, user sharded. Um, so all users, every single users, all all the permissions that belong to it are in the same uh, shard. Um, and uh, like we can kind of keep on keep on adding more like uh, machines and one users like because it is user sharded, it is uh, we can kind of scale it uh, based on that sort of like. Uh, that sort of p pattern um, we also because like we we only query like for a single user's permission we we are not really doing any sort of like multi-shard fan out sort of query so that is like scalable there um, as far as like the per scaling the permission service goes we like i said it does not really contain a lot of state and we have been scale we have we have been like pretty conservative in terms of like having it scale and so far the uh, the provisioning and the scaling policies that we have set has been like pretty good and it's been it's been kind of like uh withstanding most of the load patterns uh, as, as far as the scaling the final edge cache goes uh, this has like been run at slack for a few years now and final uh, is actually like edge deployed in like different regions and this is like kind of like battle tested in a way uh, and there's like a dedicated team that kind of works in scaling uh, Flannel um, yeah cool and, and I noticed also from the, from the diagram maybe, maybe uh, I'm, I'm reading mm -hmm. it wrong there's also like a small cache in the permission mm -hmm. service uh, mm -hmm. what are you caching there yeah that is a, that is a very short lived very short TTL permissions cache uh, that cache is that cache is actually that cache has like very short TTL that is like probably in the order of second or probably less than that, but that is for like uh, repetitive reads, uh, like and uh, that cache is also used uh, for like some of our really hot uh, permission checks, but that's like a very uh, Small TTL cache. Is is that an is that an in memory cache or is that a shared that, cache? That is an in memory cache. That is correct. So each if, if you have multiple instances of the permission service, then yep. like it's it's maybe likely that you don't hit any of those uh, unless you are doing like some like affinity in terms of like yep. calling from the backend. Okay, makes sense. Right. Um, what does the, the schema look like? For example, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're sharding by user, right? Uh, for, mm -hmm. There are probably some operations that are intentionally fast, some are slow. Like, how do you reply to a query that says, give me every user that can do something? Is, is that something that you, you are planning to do? Or is that something that you said, hey, we, we know this, this is not an ideal use case? Uh, 
Yeah, it is more of the latter. Uh, we have been very opinionated when it comes, comes to the permission checking uh, interface. Uh, rather than saying, give me all the users that can do a set of things, we, we only, the model is that you as a user should only be able to ask, can I do one or two or three things or like X things, not like everything. And you as a user should not be able to ask for what someone else can do. And you as a user should not be able to ask, give me all the users that can do something. So none of those query patterns are something that we plan to support, at least right now, because that does not really address the core like business logic to kind of go back to our goals. Our goal is to kind of build granular access control system within Slack and none of them really like fit into that story. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. That, and that's interesting because it's like one of the things I, I've been thinking about a lot when, when thinking about fine grain authorization is that kind of like the, the access patterns, the usage patterns change a bit. It, they, they are not, mm -hmm. you don't show the same UIs because you need to support those, those features. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like wrapping some, some of this conversation up, how did you roll this out without any customer impact? Um, I, I think we try to really, we have some of the material in the blog post, but we, uh, at Slack, we, we've been doing, uh, a lot of like, uh, light and dark, dark, what, what would we call light and dark testing? Um, Jake, do you want to talk about like the dark mode, uh, and like, like how we kind of like rammed up permission service? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So like I mentioned, we have, uh, these concepts of light mode and dark mode. So when, for example, we have um, two sources of truth. What we want to do is initially only actually rely on uh, the one we know for sure is true. So in this case, the web app monolith, um, when we're initially rolling something out, we're comparing the results of what we say the web app monolith, um, the verdict is whether they can or cannot take an action. And we compare that with what the permission service says. Uh, eventually, they're going to um, we're, we're coming to the realization that they'll either match or they won't match and we'll keep track of the rate at which they don't match and alert uh, if, for example, there's uh, a big differential. And once we're confident um, that they uh, are in fact matching, we would switch to light mode, in which case we would um, read from the permission service. Oh, that's that's great. That, that makes sense. Uh, we, we've actually done that a, a lot as, at Zero as well for, for a number of changes. Yeah, no. Uh, and there's a there's a very good blog post for anyone like listening in interested from Zach Holman from GitHub that's called uh, titled Boom Fast and, and Break Nothing that talks about this this particular technique. I think there's also a conference talk about that. So yeah, that's that's great. Um, what what feedback have you gotten so far from teams? Right, again, you you guys putting all of this tooling out there. You made all of these changes. What has the reaction been internally, not, not from a customer perspective? Um, that's a good question. I would say uh, initially it was, this is pretty painful. Um, and I think we adapted the tool into a point where now teams are able to seamlessly add roles. Um, that being said, anytime a team adds it, we're still you know, probing for questions and saying, is there any way we can make this better? Um, I think also some of the times... Uh, roles as a concept might be a little mysterious where it's like oh can this account for this case or can i we they're they're asking for uh, sometimes some features that just aren't supported yet that's just not something we built out um in which case the we, you know we, we need to tell them that maybe roles isn't the right uh framework for you to use just yet but no i i would say in general um you know we have several other teams at slack leveraging this framework already uh and i think overall it's been pretty positive does that scan with you ash Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. And then do, do, you, do you track any adoption metrics uh, internally uh, and, and externally for like, hey, how many people are using the feature and also how many teams are using the, the new tooling? Yeah, we, we, um, we, we, do, we have a dashboard we use internally to, um, you know, just make sure it's uh, steadily growing and that we have a solid adoption of the feature. Um, that's, so we have aggregated data for the, at the actual customer level, but we also um, have pretty extensive uh, alerting, for example, if uh, there's something we need to jump into. Okay, that's, that's very neat, cool. Um, my final question is, uh, what are your, your biggest learnings, your biggest takeaways from, from having done this work? 
Um, my biggest learning is that no matter how hard you squint, legacy code is always going to be more complex than what you thought. um yeah that's i i would say it's probably the same i think probably the hardest part at least for me where we are adding like the permission to do something new or to you know to do an existing thing for example like archiving a channel um we need to find all the places in which uh, where that's allowed and make sure that we've covered all our bases um and i think given that Slack is, you know, it's a pretty massive code base. Finding an exhaustive list of all those places is sometimes easier said than done. Yeah, you, you need to go find the people that know where the, the skeletons are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, we, we've been through through many of those as well. Uh, that, that's great, guys. Again, thanks thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, uh, is there anything else that you, you would like to add or maybe that, that you thought, hey, we need to kind of like add this other comment? Uh, I don't have any. I don't think I have any either. Okay, good. So again, to to wrap up, th- thanks again for for the time we've been talking about. Oh, oh wow, more than an hour now. Uh, so it, it's been really interesting. I I learned a bunch of things. Uh, I'm familiar with a lot of the things that you uh, talked about. Some of the the pain points that you mentioned. Uh, so I really appreciate this kind of like this deeper dive into the blog post. Um, and, and it's been great. And, and for everyone that's listening, again, hopefully you enjoyed this. Uh, we're going to be uploading a recording to, to YouTube soon and, and sharing the link. And also uh, next week, next Wednesday, June 16th, uh, a bit earlier than today because uh, the people that are going to be guests are in Europe. Uh, we're going to be talking with GitHub about uh, their authorization model uh, and how they built their systems to support it. So hopefully that's also going to be enjoyable if you enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thanks a lot, Jake. Thanks, Aish. I uh, really appreciate it. And have a good night. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.